Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. Uh, I have a special guest here today. We have Mr. Shea Hildebrand. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing awesome, man. Super excited to be able to be here and, you know, chop it up with you. <laughs> so what's interesting, right, is, guys, if you don't know uh, Shea, he played a little he played a little b-ball. I played a little baseball, too, but I couldn't hit the curve, so I, I had to get out and, and start in the business. But, uh, you know, uh, you, you're famous for uh, that 18 inning home run. Uh, but I want to before you tell your story, I want to I want to tell you a story because I want to ask you a question. So my whole life was baseball. And um, I remember my dad took me to Red Sox Yankees in Fenway. And it was one I thing I want to do like my whole like ever, like ever, ever, ever. Um, we got out of the cab. And we came around the corner. And Fenway was there, and I was like, you know those moments you're just like, fuck. Like, and it, you, like, felt it sink. And, like, I'm just curious, before we get into your story, from a, from a baseball point of view, that, that just that, that fan base, that, that, that history, like, I mean, you had to, every time you stepped on the field, it just had to be, like, pure fucking adrenaline running through you. I mean, they didn't give you a chance to have a day off. Yeah, and that's what's cool. And even when we had days off, the skipper, the manager, Jimmy Williams, had asked me if I'd want to go take ground balls on a day off with Johnny Pesky and all that. You got to understand first, man, I grew up in L.A., a die, diehard Dodger fan. So, okay. you know, you show up in the third inning, leaving the seventh inning to li- beat traffic and listen to Vince Scully on the radio. So going from that to 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 Boston, Northeast, um, Red Sox Nation, man, it's comprised of six states. I'd get fan mail from girls saying that that they've been watching every single game since they're three years old. And I'm like, are you freaking insane, man? Like, why aren't you at the beach? Why aren't we hanging out? You know what I mean? Because that's where I grew up. But uh, it is just absolutely insane, man. I can't tell you how many times, how many stories. Like, like even as a Red Sox player, I mean, playing in Fenway Park, that place is just old. But it's like a shrine. It's like mm-hmm. I played there right before the Red Sox won their first World Series. I was there from 2001 sure. to 2003. I got traded in May 2003. And, like, it just crushed me in my career because I was like, I bled red Sox red because that's all i knew yeah. outside of playing uh you know in southern california and uh i mean i can't tell you how many times like with yankees fans whether it be in new york or boston uh, like we would go to uh, new york and and i'd stay in the hotel nice hotel and i didn't realize that you have to check in under an alias name when you go to the hotel so i'm i'm just in the hotel and i'm like getting ready for the game the next day it's my rookie season and, and i'm like oh my gosh i'm the big leagues like this is what i'm built for this is what i've been created for this is what i've trained for and at 3 a.m before you right beginning of cell phones that you know really didn't have cell phones too much uh, uh 3 a.m i get a phone call in my hotel room and i'm like oh my gosh it just woke me up frantically and i didn't know if it's a my wife back home or family or whatever. And I'm like, hello. And it was somebody that like, Hillary, man, you fucking suck. <laughs> Hung up on me. I'm like, what? <laughs> it's Yankee fans trolling me at 3 a.m. Uh, in my hotel room, man. So um, that rivalry is, is, is arguably one of the biggest rivalries in sports. And uh, I was uh, blessed enough to be able to be the first Red Sox player to hit a game winning home run off of Mariano Rivera at Fenway park. And, and that that was just our status to be able to experience that. I was really super surprised, uh, but it's a matter of putting in work and doing the daily grind. And when things get monotonous, and when things get boring, and when you start suffering, I was just that person that just kept on and kept doing it. And I envisioned that as a kid in the front yard, probably like you did, um, uh, or in the backyard, like with the wiffle ball, like bottom of the ninth, two outs, bases loaded, World Series, like like just do it like all my other childhood friends. And I was just so gracious and grateful enough to be able to have that opportunity to do it real time on ESPN in uh, not not Yankee Stadium, but in Fenway Park. So uh, super awesome, man. I miss it there so much. I love it. And, you know, uh, I told three people that I was going to interview you. One uh, guy was like, you buckle in. 
he's like, you, 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 it's a great story. So, you know, what we like to do on this podcast is we like to let the guests kind of share their story, kind of where they, uh, where they want to start and kind of see where it goes from there. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Like, uh, like you said, I'm, I'm a two time MLB all-star. I made tens of millions of dollars, uh, playing major league baseball. I have an Emmy award winning story and I owned a zoo. So yeah, you guys heard that correctly. I owned a zoo. I think it might be the first person in major league baseball history player to leave major league baseball and buy a zoo. I had 300 farm and exotic animals. It was crazy. It was asinine. I've been a performer, top performer or an elite performer pretty much my whole life, but it didn't start that way. You see, I'm 14 years old and I'm sitting on my bed and my dad walks into my room and he drops a bombshell on me. He just says, Hey son, we're moving out of state. I was like, what? I mean, you got to understand this is the formative years of my life. I'm just leaving junior high because ninth grade was junior high back then going to high school. I'm trying to make my name. I don't have a voice. I don't have an identity outside of baseball and my friends. So the story I told myself when my dad left the room that day was I'm not lovable. I'm not good enough. And my dad doesn't love me. And the perspective I formed from that story I told myself that day innocently from that experience ultimately breaks me. So as I reluctantly leave all my childhood friends and sports and community from beautiful Southern California, palm trees, beaches, I moved to the hot desert of Arizona, cactus, heat, craziness. It was so far different than anything I ever knew, but I didn't know what to do. So as, as my dad uprooted us, I decided to become an overachiever through athletics. So I put my head down and I worked harder and harder and harder than I ever did in my life. Not to go to the big leagues, not to try to make the varsity team in high school, not to become the best player, but to be in admiration of my parents' approval. I'm just trying to get my parents' love for me and get approval in my father's eyes. That's all I was trying to see. So in high school, I became the number one soccer player in the state of Arizona. Um, it was awesome. I was really a lot better at soccer than baseball. Um, I had opportunities to play in Europe. I had opportunities to play at, at four-year D1 universities. But my childhood dream was to play Major League Baseball. See, growing up in Southern California, I was a diehard Dodger fan. And I'd sit at the top deck of the stadium. My mom had season tickets with myself and my best friend. We'd go to the games on a consistent basis. And I didn't really care about the fan. I didn't care about the players. I would sit up there with my nachos in one hand and my chocolate malt in the other hand. And I'd sit there and I'd envision, I'm going to be on that field one day. I'm going to be on that field one day from eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old. I'd engage my senses. See, visualization is the number one tool that we have access to in our tool belt. But so many people don't do it because they don't believe that it can happen. So I'd hear the crack of the bat. I'd hear the roar of the crowd, the energy of the fans. I'd smell the grass freshly cut. And then I always imagined the announcer, the PA announcer announcing my name, now batting number 29, Shay Hillenbrand. And I'd go home at night and inherently do this. I don't know how I did it. I wasn't trained, but I'd lay in bed and I'd envision cashing million dollar paychecks. I'd envision my name being at the ticker at the bottom of the ESPN Shea Hillenbrand, four for four, whatever that is. And I envisioned being on TV and cracking home runs. And I just did it. So after my sophomore season of playing junior college baseball, see, I didn't have any opportunities to go anywhere. After high school, I didn't have any opportunities to play baseball anywhere. So I, I walked on at a local junior college. And the only reason I made that team is because my work ethic. I was the first guy there, the last guy to leave every single day. I put my head down and I mastered step one of, hitting off a batter's tee. See, so many people try to go to so many different levels of, I want to get up here, go to level seven, eight, nine. Now you got to master level one to create that foundation so you have something to build on. So after my sophomore season of, of, of junior college baseball, I became the number one junior college baseball player in the state of Arizona, giving me a chance to be drafted by the Boston Red Sox. My dream are coming true. Like what happens next changes everything for me. But the thing is, is that when I got drafted by the Boston Red Sox, I told all my friends and family at 20 years old that I got drafted by the White Sox. They're like, what are you talking about, dude? You got drafted by the Red Sox, one of the most prestigious organizations. Red Sox, Yankees, a rivalry, it's crazy, the evil empire. And then the underdog, 1918, it's a nation, man, six states it's comprised of. And I said, wait, 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 dude, 
Jill, I don't want to hear your crap. First, I am a Dodger fan. I don't know anything about baseball outside of Chavez Ravine, because if you're a West Coast baseball fan, it's nothing compared to what, what you guys are talking about. And number two, I don't give a damn what socks it is. I'm going to the big leagues. See, when I was a kid in fifth grade, Mr. Murphy came around. The teacher, what do you guys want to do when you grow up? Let's, let's dream day. I'm vigorously raising my hand in the back of the room. And he says, okay, Shay, what do you want to do? And I said, I'm playing Major League Baseball, and I'm going to own a zoo. And all my team, all my uh, uh, classmates laughed at me. And Mr. Murphy said, like, okay. And I'm like, fool, I'm going to do it. I'm going to find a way. So when I go to spring training my first season of pro ball, I'm in a whole new environment. I'm coming out of the batting cage, and the minor league director comes up to me, the guy in charge of the whole minor league system, and he was watching me. He says, son, you have all the ability to become a major league baseball player and make millions and millions of dollars. And that right there caught me because I was like, I want to get there to show that I'm worthy enough of my father's love. I barely knew what team I was on, and I was, I was so green. And I said three things. So there's three things that you have to do in order to get yourself from where you are right now to get unsuck, to go and try to achieve what your dream or aspiration is. The first thing is you have to find someone who's been there and done it, which is the minor league director for me. He actually came to me because I worked so hard. I showed something to him that I had potential. So we can only control what we work on, not the outcome. It's the input that we work on, right? That's what we can focus on. So I just focused on mastering the craft of hitting off the tee and hitting in the batting cage. So he came up to me and he said, hey, you could do this. And I said, step two, lay out a plan for me. What do I need to do? So I asked him, I said, what do I need to do? So he laid out this plan for me. He said, just do this, do this, do this, do this. Then you get yourself a chance to go and achieve what you're trying to achieve. And the third thing was is the hardest part of this three-step formula is you got to put it into action. So I just took action. All my other teammates, everybody else is making excuses, current situation. I'm not a top draft pick. I was a, I was a bottom draft pick. I, all these, and I was out there just working. I don't know what you all are doing. I'm going to the big leagues. So in five years of the minor leagues, I became player of the year three of the five years. Mind you, just three years ago, I walked on at a local junior college because I had no opportunity to play baseball anywhere after high school. Here I am making my way through the ranks uh, of, of the minor league system, and I was able to be malleable. I got drafted as a shortstop the first 10 games of pro ball. I made 14 errors. I don't know how to field a ground ball. Then they moved me to third base and first base. Then they moved me to left field. Then they said, do you want to learn how to catch? And I was like, yeah, I want to learn how to catch. I just want to go to the big leagues. So your vision, your dream, your goal, your target, we have to lock in on that, but we have to allow diversity. We have to be able to be malleable to allow ourselves to go from here to here. So many of us get stuck in a spot to where we feel like, I want to do this. This is my goals. This is how I'm going to get there. And if that doesn't happen, then we love that BS and that nonsense and limited beliefs in our mind rattle around telling us that we're not good enough. We're not lovable. We can't do it. All that crap. But I was able to know, go out there and, and traverse and, and I'm going to big league camp in 2001 as a minor leaguer. There's minor league baseball camp for spring training and there's big league spring training camp. And I went to camp and I was like, I'm going as a catcher. So I put my head down and I just worked and worked and worked and worked and worked while my friends were just hanging out. My comrades were getting nervous and fearful. I'm just working. I'm like, I'm here just to prepare myself to become the AAA starting catcher in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And I'm just working. So I, I worked my way all the way through spring, spring training. And I, and I really leveraged the opportunities I had because I knew how to work. It's all in the preparation, how you work and not the, not the performance. It's, it's, it's what you do behind the scenes in the batting cage, in the backfield, taking ground balls, in the bullpen, catching and catching and working and mastering your craft. Because that's the skill sets that we have to do to go to the next level because skill sets have utility. And when you have skill sets that have utility and you deploy them, good things are going to happen. So I get all the way through to the last day of spring training in Major League Spring Training. I'm going to start at third base during that game in St. Pete. I'm in Fort Myers, Florida with the Red Sox. We're in St. Pete against the Tampa Bay Devil Rays. And I'm, start, I'm getting ready at my locker. And the bench coach comes up to me. And he's the liaison between the manager and the players. He's kind of like the go-to guy. And he said, hey, Shane, Skipper wants to see you. 
And I was like, sweet, man. I'm so proud of myself. I made it all the way through spring training. I, I did everything I said I was going to do. And I had good results. I'm ready to go down to AAA. And I'm ready to start at third base and make my statement there because I just came from double A. And I walk into the manager's office and he reaches out his hand to me and he says, congratulations, son. You made this team. $125 million payroll. I'm getting ready for AAA as a catcher. And this dude right here just tells me, you made the team. I thought Ashley Kutcher was going to pop out like a punk. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, how's this even possible? So many people focus on the end result, the outcome that you really don't have any control over. It's how you prepare. So I leave and I'm like, I just made the big leagues. I was the first guy from double A to the big leagues to skip triple A for 30 years to do it. Mind you, I walked on to junior college because I didn't know how to play baseball. I didn't have any opportunities, but I put my head down like every successful entrepreneur, every successful person out there that goes, and I just worked. There's no secret to this, this formula. So we leave spring training and we go to Houston for the first game. And I always wanted to get into a big league uniform. Right. And in spring training, if you're a minor leaguer, you have a high number, number 71. I want a low number because if I have a low number, I am, am going to be a big leaguer. So I walk in the actually I go to go to the hotel room, um, Ritz Carlton in Houston. I go to put my, my key in the door and there's a doorbell and I open it. I'm like, I've never been in anything but a Motel 6. And I open it up and the room's so vast that if I'm on the other side of the room, you couldn't hear, I couldn't hear you knock. So you'd have, I'm like, what? So I'm jumping up on top of the bed, like Macaulay Culkin, like I'm in the big leagues, man. Like, what? are you serious, man? My dream. Like, like, how is this possible? I can't even fathom it right now. So I go to the ballpark four hours early the next day. I walk into the clubhouse in Houston. I don't know what it's called now, but it was Minute Maid Park where the Astros play. And the clubhouse manager's like, welcome to the big, what's that? Astrodome. I grew up in Sugarland, Houston. I grew up in Houston. So yeah. Astrodome. Yeah. So yeah. now it's like Minute Maid Park or whatever, the new ballpark. So uh, um, I uh, I walk in, the clubhouse guy's like, uh, Mr. Hill man, welcome to the big leagues. Let me show you a locker. And I go around the corner and it says number 29, Shea Hillenbrand. The boss, I'm like, I, I, I got to get my uniform on. So I'm four hours early and I put my uniform on. I'm sitting in my locker like, dude, this is the most amazing thing ever. Because when you go to big league spring training, like, like, they put they, they have a custom tailor come in to, to get custom measurements for your uniform to have it cut like pajamas like perfectly fit your body like a like a five thousand dollar suit and in the minor leagues it's just like putting on a freaking whatever like a youth youth freaking baseball uniform like there's such a vast difference and they make it like that to get you hungry to go to the show so i'm sitting there at my locker getting ready like this like just and that same bench coach comes over to me and he says hey shay skipper wants to see you and instantly my stomach drops. I'm like, gosh, dang, damn it. I didn't even get a, a bat in the big leagues, dude. This dude's going to send me down already. Like, I'm already going, like, there's no other reason for the manager to talk to you. So I make the walk of death to the manager's office. And, 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 and my stomach's in my freaking throat. And I just feel nauseous. And I said, hey, Skipper, uh, um, he said, you, you, you wanted to see me? Yeah, yes, son, sit down. So I sit down on the couch across from the desk. And the manager says, I've been thinking about it a lot. Um, you're going to be my starting third baseman on opening day. And I just got up and I was like, thank you very much. And I walked out of, out of the office. I'm like, what is going on right now? I don't even know how to play third base. I'm a catcher. I'm like, I, 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 you just got to do it. So many people say like, ready, aim, fire. You have to say ready, fire, aim. Like you just got to go and take the action and put yourself out there because you never know what's going to happen. So over the next seven memorable years of Major League Baseball, I did so many things on Major League Baseball fields that I never thought imaginable in my life. All those dreams that I envisioned when I was a kid at the top deck of Dodger Stadium. I was the first guy to hit a game-winning home run from Mariano Rivera. I was a two-time All-Star. I had highlight after highlight after highlight. I played in a perfect game at first base with Randy Johnson in, in Arizona against in Atlanta. And then I had three home runs in consecutive innings. I was another, two other uh, no-hitters. So many things. Uh, I made tens of millions of dollars. And I had everything. I was flying private jets. I had multiple mansions. 
I had six automobiles. When you're rich, you call them automobiles, right? It's not cars, it's an automobile. I don't know why we call it. Like, what are you talking about? I had 300 pairs of shoes. I had anything and everything I ever wanted in my life on top of the world. I summit this mountain and I'm standing up there like I am God. I have little girls in the stands holding up signs saying, will you marry me, Shay? I'm doing autograph signings for $10,000 an hour. And girls are coming to the table, teenagers, crying and shaking just because they get to meet me like I'm Justin Bieber. But what they can't see is that deep, deep pain resonating inside me, fueling that pain-driven game. You see, I had everything in the world on top of the world, living that life that so many people just imagine as a celebrity professional athlete on TV every single night. But you know what I didn't have? I didn't have fulfillment. I didn't know who I was outside of what I did. And I definitely didn't own my life. So right there in the prime of my career after my seventh season, I make a decision proven to be the biggest decision of my life. I quit. I walk away. I leave $50 million of potential earnings on the table. I'm in the driver's seat doing anything I could ever want to do. And I hated myself. I fly into the all-star game in a Citation 10 private jet from Chandler Air. Arizona, Detroit, Michigan. I'm going 64,000 feet, 640 miles an hour. It's the fastest civilian jet in the world. You guys can Google it. It's a Citation 10 jet. Imagine yourself, pilot, co-pilot, 10 passenger jet, and you're by yourself. No distractions, no entourage, no family, no kids with you. I'm looking out the window. I can't see the ground. I'm so high. And the thoughts are going through my mind when I'm looking out the window. As I'm going to my childhood dream to play in front of 100 million people the next day on stage, on the Midsummer Classic, is this what it all is about? Is this what it is? I hate everything about this stuff. See, I'd put all my eggs in one basket of the performer and not the basket of Shea Hillenbrand. When I went to the ballpark, I had all the coaches I ever wanted. Hitting coach, throwing coach, strength coach, mental coach. We had a video guy that analyzed everything to go over that. We had a massage therapist, a chef. We had an orthopedic surgeon. We have trainers. We have everything that we want. But when I left the field each and every night, the stadium, I was by myself. I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have a coach to work on Shea. See, that's what happens to so many people. As we put all of our eggs in one basket and say, if I just get here, if I just do this, and if I get the admiration, I'll get that stuff, but it doesn't work. So, so, so I can cock this great idea in my mind to pursue my second childhood dream. I'm leaving Major League Baseball. I'm coming home to be a father to my three beautiful children I haven't seen forever. And then I'm going to buy a zoo. I've always wanted to buy a zoo. Have you seen the movie Matt, from Matt Damon? We bought a zoo. Like, that's me. <laughs> that wasn't based that on you. me, but that was me. So I purchased a $5 million horse farm in, in, out here in Arizona, a 38-acre horse farm. And, and, I, and I accumulate 300 farm and exotic animals. I have camels, kangaroos, llamas, alpacas, monkeys, raccoons. I have two 800-pound Wilshire pigs, Taco Bell and Gilbert. I had a blind horse, a CNI pony, a three-legged goat. And I envision rescuing and rehabilitating these animals that are in a position that need help and then put them in a position to interact with the inner city, child crisis, and, and struggling kids in my community. And let me tell you what. The joy I received witnessing these animals on a daily basis transform thousands of children's lives in my community through my nonprofit foundation is priceless. What happened there superseded anything I ever did on a major league baseball field. It was crazy what happened. I had quickly become the guy that owned Marley Farms, the zoo, and not the guy that was a two-time officer in the big leagues. I was like Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. This stuff was insane. I'm bound to find fulfillment now because Major League Baseball didn't do it. The fame, the glory, the money, everything, the success, the status, the, the God being treated like a God, that didn't do it. But either did this. See, eight years ago, I found myself on the floor of a van parked outside my ex-wife's house. I had nothing left in my life. My children are arm's distance away. And after overdosing on drugs and alcohol, here lies a guy that so many people envied. Matter of fact, my children are going to school at that time, telling all their friends that my dad played for the Arizona Diamondbacks. As I'm scrounging up change out of the cup holder in my van, just to try to feed my little Caesar's pizza to my kids. Try dealing with that as a man. So here I am motionless on the floor of this van. 
And as the soul's leaving the top of my head, I'm clinging onto my last breath. But the thoughts that I'm battling in my mind are, you're a loser. You lost everything. You're, you're a mess up. You're an idiot. What would your parents think if you left this world today, Shay? What kind of dad would do this to his kids, Shay? You said you quit for them, but you didn't. My answer to that was, I don't know. Nothing if I don't have baseball. I was so tired of fighting the pain-driven game because I didn't know who I was from that perspective that I formed from that story at 14 years old. Like so many of us have done right here listening to this podcast. I'm not good enough. I'm not lovable. My dad doesn't love me. So I let go. I don't know if I died or if I fell asleep. See, my name had become the game of Major League Baseball, my identity. But by the grace of God, the next day I woke up and when I came to, I didn't have any side effects, no nothing. And I sat there and I sat up in this van that I was living in seven years ago. You know how hard that is for me to tell you that humbling and vulnerable, how bad I feel about myself at that time. And I said, Shay, you got to do something. I was faced with two difficult decisions right at that time. After I lived out both my childhood dreams on top of the world, I said, I got to take back control of my life and I have to own who I am. I never had to own who I was because I was able to hide behind that veil of major league baseball, superstar status. People always coming to me and I was always giving stuff away to help other people out, but I couldn't help myself. So I just took one step at a time. I knew I had to get myself into momentum ASAP. And when I got into momentum, I had strategic people coming to my life to do two things and two things only. They provided me direction and accountability. See, when you get into momentum, guys, what happens from there, you will get rewarded. We just have to get into momentum, take that one step and show up every single day, regardless of what your mind says. And then after that, I really understood that over the next seven years of my life, I put my head down and worked on Shay, the person, not Shay, the performer. And what I did is I discovered a deeper version of myself, something with substance. And through that process, I discovered three powerful principles that I base my life on today. And the first one is what I just told you about is momentum. Life is about momentum. And the second thing is leveraging your language. I didn't really understand and take a look at myself in the mirror and say, What are you saying to yourself? Because the most important conversation that we'll ever have in our life is the conversation we have with ourselves. But the kicker is that conversation we have with ourselves is the foundation of who we are. If you want to get unstuck from where you are right now and and scale to places you thought unimaginable, you have to understand how to leverage the language you use to yourself. Then I shifted into belief. I was like, man, playing Major League Baseball, there's only one thing that every Major League Baseball player has in common. That's if given the opportunity, we believe that we're going to come through. I don't care if I'm a bench player or a superstar franchise player making $400 million. We believe we could do it. I didn't believe who I was outside of baseball. See, the most powerful force that we'll ever come across is for us to stay congruent to what we believe to be true about ourselves. So my question is, is what do you believe to be true about yourself? Because once you understand how to elevate your belief system, you're going to tap into a power. So I tapped into a power that you're experiencing right now that elevated me to levels that I didn't even understand that were possible. And that's what's led me to here. When I played Major League Baseball, I didn't have a voice. You good? I'm good, man. Are you good? <laughs> I really don't want to say anything. I just want to end the podcast and walk off the stage right now. Cause, uh, <laughs> dude, like, yes. I mean like all the things and so much more like that last 20, 25 minutes, like is the roadmap to everything, everything. And it's I'm sitting here having my own epiphanies because our story is eerily similar. Um, and I'm thinking through my own addiction and my own uh, blacked out and my own homelessness. And I always tell everybody, you know what America loves the best? They love the before and after pictures. They're, they're suckers for the before and after picture, the right? Comeback story, right? Yeah. But you know what's the number one thing that's pointing at the people that I respect the most that said about me and about my picture before and my picture after? They say one thing. They don't say you look great. They say you look happy. That's it. 
the one thing I found through this whole process is my smile. Yes. I have so many highlights. Smile. I have so many highlights on a major league baseball field. I never smiled once. But I always told myself when I played major league baseball, I was going to smile for every picture that I took with a fan because I never knew what anybody was going through. And I could be that saving grace, maybe that one anchor to let them know that you can do it. So I always smiled. You'll never see me ever a picture taken with a fan where I didn't smile. And I tried so hard to do that because you see so many professional athletes that, that are, are stuck on themselves and their ego that didn't do that. And then the one thing that I found when I, when I, when I found my wife, my current wife now, the one thing I loved about her was, was her smile. That was a, what I was, I, I, I didn't have my smile in my whole life as I lived out my dream because of what I believed to be true about myself. And that's the one thing now is when once you discover who you are, once you once you once you uncover those, uh, peel back the layers of the onions and really go inwardly. The, the greatest battle I ever fought was not the battle on the baseball field between the lines, underneath the lights, with the fans eating the popcorn in front of forty thousand, with Stephen A. Smith on TV talking crap about me to get ratings. Those battles were easy. The biggest battle I ever fought was the internal battle, and that's the biggest battle we'll ever fight. But we're so difficult as men to say, you know what? I, I need to, 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 to let this out. I need to address this stuff because we see it as, as weakness. We see it as, 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 as a hit of our ego. But, but what I discovered in the process is that once you uncover and discover and shift that perspective, see, the perspective I had at 14 years old was 100% incorrect. My dad moved us to Arizona from California to give me the best chance to play Major League Baseball. But we were battling a generational curse because the stuff that my dad went through with his father was so far greater than what I had to go through. My dad had to pull his mom out of bars at 13 and 14 years old because his dad wouldn't do it. And his dad would. And I'm sitting there like, when I discovered that, see, I was able to rewrite history. You can rewrite history with your life. I'm sitting here at 46 years old and I lost everything after being the stars of, of the world. And, and I went back and, and, I, and I uncovered and I was able to process through and say, well, what, what happened here, mom, with dad? She, and she told me, and with the intel that I gathered, I, I didn't actually change the experience in my life, but I just switched to perspective because your power is locked up in your perspective. But to see the pain that's driven from these experiences, we don't allow ourselves to switch that perspective because we run numb and flee from that pain. I was able to cover it up with, with Major League Baseball. I don't know how I, got, how I didn't get on cocaine. I don't know how I didn't become a drug addict. I don't know how I didn't become an alcoholic because that's the pain and the crap that I had to deal with every day. But I had baseball to cover that up. So a lot of us that don't become addicts, we covered up with success. We covered up with status. But what I realized through the process, I'm waking up in a $4 million mansion in Anaheim playing for the angels, like my childhood, where I grew up, like the first word out of my mouth every day was the F word. Ah! My wife would turn over, was like, what, what's wrong with you, Shay? And I'm like, you'll never know. You'll never know because I don't know. All I know is like, I'm living my dream and I hate every aspect of it. So ultimately, I hated myself. And I mean, obviously, you know, we talked before, so I know what you're working on now. Um, you know, do you know who Darren Prince is? I do. Uh, he was, he's the, he's the talent manager for like Irving Johnson and like Muhammad Ali. And he had oh, a drug cool. addiction and all that But he says a line that I say to myself almost every day. And uh, he says, I'm not where I want to be. I'm not who I want to be, but at least I'm not who I used to be. And when you look back, I mean, I know you wouldn't change anything, but it's so funny because I, my parents got divorced at 17 and I blame myself for their marriage. And that's why I abused alcohol and drugs and played the victim most of my life. And it was a book, uh, Extreme Ownership, that changed my life. And when somebody got up in my grill and said, listen, enough, like your story doesn't stick with me, motherfucker, figure it out. And I called my dad and I took full ownership of the relationship that we had. And, and it felt like a, a, a chain, but I think the bigger question here and, and is that identity piece, right? 
and you see it a lot. And, and, uh, my coach, you know, was a MMA fighter in Thailand, like a big time dude. And he broke his knee and was depressed for three years. So how does one, when you are successful, when you are top of the heap, like, how do you make sure that you're not, cause I think that identity shifts, but I think the identity may, mainly needs to sit with you completely on what your values are and who you are. But I think that people get so much gratitude from it, you know, with their success and all their bullshit. How do you, how do you separate yourself from the identity piece? And you touched on it perfectly. Um, identity and values drive behavior. So if you look at Shea Hillenbrand scaling the ranks of Major League Baseball, my identity, I didn't have one. I was so good at sports or whatever, like I can get away with doing that. I didn't even know how to communicate with someone. And my values, I didn't have any values. I'm hitting the baseball. I'm going to the big leagues. I'm having success. But if you want to find happiness, you have to have progression, right? Progression is the key to happiness. And I, I say there's three areas of our life, like three pillars that, that we have to operate within the parameters every single time. If we understand what we need to do in each one of those pillars, then we give ourselves a position to grow and become the fullest version of ourselves on a daily basis. That's your personal pillar. That's you, right? So, so I have to understand I got to grow and I have to give in order to have progression happen. I have to be hungry. I have to be go out there and fill myself up every single day. I never always, I, I didn't always talk like this. I didn't always give interviews like this. I, I was, I, I work diligently when I'm awake, when I'm awake during the week, I'm either working or working out. Like, like I'm, I'm mastering this craft all day long with what I'm trying to do, but I have to understand where I get my energy from. See, when you're so successful, it's so easy just to put that in the back seat. But if we understand how to find fulfillment through the process, then you're going to perform and have so much more success and achieve fulfillment and understanding through the process to where the stress just comes off you in places that you didn't even know what, uh, what would be able to do. So with, with myself, it's like you have to grow and you have to give. Then, then you have your professional pillar. Then you have your, your private pillar. I say your private pillar because as a professional athlete, my interpersonal relationships is my private life. You guys can mess with me. Don't, don't, don't mess with my wife. Don't mess with my kids. Don't mess with that stuff. So that's like your interpersonal relationships. So um, like I said, right now, I have five kids. I have to do the things I have to do like everybody else to get up and do those things. But I know right now I'm going to make more money and have more success and make more impact now than I ever did play Major League Baseball. How is that possible? I worked on myself. I was forced to, right? There's, there's two options to be humbled. Either you humble yourself and learn the techniques that all of us try to teach you or life will humble you. And that latter part, it's tough. That Delta is so extreme, man. Like I'm on top of the world and I, I liken it to like, like if you're in Africa and somebody owns a tent and they go out and hunt for the day because that's what they have to do to eat. And they come back home and, they're, and somebody stole their tent. Right. Like, like that's that the delta right there of losing that tent where they sleep. It's not that severe because there's a good chance they're going to find something to find shelter that night because that's just they're just going to do that. And they can get branches. They can get uh, cattle hide or whatever. They can find ways to find shelter. But when you go to the top and do something that you have a better chance of winning the lottery than doing what I did with the like, number wise and, 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 and losing everything. That delta is so severe, and this happens with successful people that lose their money or uh, uh, successful people that have kids that are rich. That, like that delta is so severe that coming out of that, I'm telling you, like I'm more proud of that than I ever did to play major league baseball because that's a harder thing to come out of because you want to just put a pistol in your mouth. You just want to give up. You just want to like take the easy road out and just do it. But what I found right now with the success that I'm having and having the fulfillment through the process is I have a different perspective now, right? So, so like I said, I call it like five Ps. We have pain points and pressure points in our life. And the perspective we form from that is going to either grant us access, grant us access, or deny us access to the power we have within. Like my whole major league career, I was really good as a performer, but I blocked the power that I had. I was slated to be a $100 million baseball player, but I made $20 million. That's one-fifth. I don't care about the numbers. But I, but I sat there, I'm like, why did Shea Hillenbrand not reach his full potential? Because I'm like, I did everything I could. Oh, 
I had to work on myself and I had to understand the perspectives I formed with different areas in my life. See, when I form this perspective from this pain point, I, I always instantly think that I got to go to the end. I have to get profit. I have to get status. I have to get success to, to be able to, to rectify and, and take care of all the problems I have in my life. If I just get this, all this stuff will go away, but it doesn't. At the end of the night, we have to all put our heads in the pillow at night, regardless of where you are or what you do, or put our head down somewhere. And we have to deal with ourselves. And a lot of people can't deal with themselves, so they distract themselves. They run them and flee. So don't give them access to change that perspective. So if you switch that perspective to, to that pain point where you can leverage that pain as fuel, then what happens, you tap into a power, then that drives purpose. And then profit can't not come when you're living on purpose, doing something that you've been called to do, because I believe everybody has a purpose. But so many of us just go from pain point to profit. I did it. And I see it time and time again, the bookends of each other, and you miss out on the meat of the method, which is perspective, power, and then purpose. Once you align those that way, which I experienced and what I teach on is that what I share is that if we do that, then you set yourself in a position to take off and scale to heights that you didn't even, I, I never even thought imaginable I would be doing this right now. And I, and I love this way more than I ever loved playing Major League Baseball. I thought that was my dream. This is my dream. But my dream was locked up in my perspective. So good. Like, like true coach, screw baseball, like life coach. You just laid it out perfectly over these couple of minutes. Just seriously like i cannot wait to share this and and send it to everybody because right there is basically everything that you need to do because you know the name of the podcast is to construct your life how to build a lifestyle not a bank account and i you know had a decent year this year and uh a really good year you know 20 times what i what i've ever done and i realized awesome. something no no it's great but who cares i i realized something that I didn't change. Like, like I thought that this was going to be something. And then I realized like, man, my life was pretty fucking awesome. Like whether I had the money or didn't have the money. Right. And so what I realized is by 10 X what I'm doing, it, it gives me the freedom to give other people jobs and then add more fulfillment. Right. And, and that's all that really matters to me. And I figure if I take care of those things, the rest of the stuff will take care of itself. And it, and it does over and over again. And so, you know, my big mission to everybody, you know, I grew up, um, my dad was a doctor in, in Sugar Land in Houston, and we grew up next to all the NBA players. And, you know, I had the whole thing. And, and I realized that every one of those people in that neighborhood were the most miserable sons of bitches I've ever met in my entire life. <laughs> they were, they could hide and I promised myself themselves. I would never do that. Yeah. 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 I promise. And that's what I battled too. And, and, and when you're saying that, I played against the Sugarland Skeeters uh, uh, in 2012. So I, I've been in that yeah. area. But uh, what I discovered through this is like, like, how do I, how do I, because I teach like design your all star life, right? So it's like mm -hmm. I designed, I created this person that's sitting here today. I just didn't just show up and oh, this is how I was playing baseball. Just Google me, dude. I was the biggest a hole playing baseball. I mean, I, 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 just, I got in a fight with the manager in Toronto. Like we have a really cool movie that's going to come out like uh, in the making that we don't have to make anything up for about my life. We're probably gonna have to take some stuff out. Be like, no, that had to be fake. No, he really did that. Like I was insane. So if people could see like where I was then and where I was, where I'm now, it's just like, like your behavior, like your identity and your values drive behavior, right? Your behavior leads anything that that you have your behavior leads uh, your emotion, your feelings, your talent, your ability. So how you behave, the decisions you make and the decisions you don't make on a daily basis, right? Like I'm talking to my son right now, he's playing, trying out for high school football, but I'm trying to do everything I can to keep him from the skate park. Because if you look at the statistics from the skate park with kids and success and on the football field, there's like not even in the same ballpark. So I try to tell my son like, okay, you hang out with your friends that are skaters, they're allowed to, they can make decisions and not have any repercussions because they're, they're, there's not really any direction of where they're going. It's just a hangout. But you're, you're over here. You can't make the same decisions as these people and expect to have success. So the people now, the generation now, they think they make it any decision that they want and still have success. And it breaks my heart because they're just letting themselves down and they're being led in the wrong direction. So I'm, tr I'm trying to provide that voice for them, a, a light for them in that aspect. But there's four things that we can control. 
And if you want to talk about uh, taking advantage and really designing your behavior and put it in a position to, to go to that all-star level is the first thing that you can control is what you watch on TV when you get home at night or what you watch on your phone. Like, check it out. If you just watch three minutes of the, of the news in the morning, that increases your chances 27% that you're going to have a shitty day just by watching the news for three minutes. So it's like you're playing defense all day long because what you're putting in and what you're watching. The second thing you're in control of is what you listen to when you're in your car. Like I like new age country, but if I'm not in the right mood, it's going to tell me what I want to get drunk. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to beat my wife and I want to like shoot my dog and like all that stuff. And like, when I play baseball, like, like I lived, I listened to Marshall Mathers, Eminem. Like I resonated with him so much because I was angry. But, and if people don't know who Marshall Mathers, Eminem is, he's like an angry rapper. And it's just like, no, dude, like that really sent me and really drove in that negativity in my life and that self-perception of myself. So where I wasn't allowed, allowing myself to sustain success, I had a lot of success, but I didn't sustain it because of what I thought about myself. The third thing is, is who you talk to on the phone. You're, you're in control of who you talk to on the phone, who you allow speak into your life. It's so important. Do you get with your friends? Do you get on the people? gossip do you do you judge people do you do you talk negativity about people like i i share with people my mom uh bless her heart i love her to death i cut my parents out of my whole career and i have to live with that which really is a crummy thing to live with but i talk, i moved my mom down next to me my father passed away four years ago and i talked to her every day i have to stand on guard in my mind because my mom will throw some negative stuff out there all the time who you allow to speak into your life on the phone and the last thing is what comes out of your mouth we have to watch what comes out of your mouth. You can control that. Those four things you can control. See, a negative thought is 10 times more powerful than a positive thought. This is what I teach the athletes. This is what I teach major league baseball players. A negative thought is more 10 times, 10x uh, positive thought. And if it comes out of your mouth, it's amplified four to 7%. So what does that mean? If you say something negative out, out of your mouth, I'm not good enough. I can't do it. I'm a piece of shit. It's 40 to 70% that that's going to happen. So we got to be so careful of what comes out of our mouth because we're going to have those thoughts all the time. We have to stand on guard of our, our minds by pouring the good in and overriding the weeds, all the negative stuff, because that negative stuff's going to be there all the time. It's going to come out of it all the time. There's going to be triggers that allow us to be negative. And if that comes out of our mouth, that's going to put us in a position just to keep blocking ourselves, ingraining those limited beliefs and that BS rambling around our mind, which I call Confining yourself inside your internal zoo. <laughs> I love animals. A zoo shackled to complacency, mediocrity, and, and, and to the status quo. And then you're like, well, I'm in this job. I'm supposed to be doing this. I really wanted to do that, but I know I can't do this because that's just that self talk going over and over and over again. So, to give you an end result to those four steps, just don't say stupid shit. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> right? I love it. I love it. It's so money. So if people want to find out more about what you have going on, they want to follow you, how would they do that? You can hit me up on socials. I'm Shay Hillenbrand underscore, uh, Shay underscore Hillenbrand on, on IG. Uh, Shay Hillenbrand, you can just Google me. Uh, be prepared when you Google me. It's really entertaining, <laughs> my career. Um, and then uh, Shay Hillenbrand uh, is my website. I got a, I got a coaching program uh, and I teach. Uh, j- just envision kind of like... Uh, uh, Navy SEALs that come out and they teach uh, with their accelerated uh, mindsets. They teach leadership and they teach mindset stuff. I do that stuff as an MLB player. So I have MLBmindset.com. You can go there, and check it out. Um, Cause hitting the baseball, failing on a baseball field. That's all we do. I hit uh, 310 for the D backs in 2004 and I had 580 plate appearances. So if you do the math, that means I failed 400 times out of 580 times, 400 times in front of the world. And I made millions of dollars. So I take pride uh, because the number one thing that we got to do to band together as brothers is teach people uh, mindset stuff because we are in our own way, not our circumstances, not our excuses, not our current situation. It's our mindset. What do we believe to be true about ourselves? How are we talking to ourselves? And are we in momentum? Because if you lose momentum, you, you, you die in any aspect of your life. Guys, you know what I say at the end of every episode? I say, if you don't get some value from this, send it to a friend. I don't give a fuck what you think. If you didn't get value from this, and I don't know what you're doing. Listen to it a couple times. I know that I'm already sending it 
every one of my coaching clients right now after I get done with this. I can't thank you enough. Super inspiring. Amazing to hear your stories. Share it with some friends, guys, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, brother. Thank you for listening to Construct Your Life with Austin Lenny. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to start constructing your life by taking immediate action on what you learned. For show notes, resources, and more information on one-on-one coaching with Austin, visit constructyourlifepodcast.com.